See, Jermaine, well, there are cars stranded in large lakes of water throughout St. John's right now. Including one of our own vehicles trapped in floodwaters after today's snowstorm turned to rain on the Avalon. It caused havoc for many on the afternoon commute home. Here now, Zach Gowdy and our videographer got stuck along Newfoundland Drive. And Zach is still there right now, as you can see. So, Zach, what happened and what's it like out there? Well, I know we started this morning covering a snowstorm. I didn't expect to be covering a flood by the end of the day, but that is how it happened today in St. John's. Traffic chaos in this city as large washouts overtook many streets. Now, as you can see, it's still a wet night out here, but just a couple of hours ago where I am standing, the standing water was up to my knees, and I know that specifically because our CBC News van stalled out right here in the middle of Newfoundland Drive. We had to jump out of that van and splash our way through the water, uh, pushing the van out of the road. And then since we were stuck here, you know, we got the camera out and took some pictures so you guys could see this scene for yourself. Really, the flooding couldn't have happened at a worse time. Heavy snow this morning stocked up several of the storm drains and then some flash flooding this afternoon led to washouts here on Newfoundland Drive. Many similar scenes all over the city. And what you're seeing there are vehicles approaching this large washout, uh, many deciding that they couldn't go through it, pulling U-turns in the middle of heavy traffic. Some people who tried to get through, like ourselves, weren't lucky and stalled out. At one point, there was three or four stalled out vehicles right here on Newfoundland Drive and Torbay Road. Again, a very busy intersection and all of this happening right at the beginning of the evening rush hour. Just absolute traffic chaos here for a little while. And of course, when scenes like that unfold, everywhere I looked, I saw people filming the scene with their smartphones. I spoke with two such people who were hanging out watching the whole thing unfold. 15 minutes to about 40 minutes. It just progressively got worse. I don't know what the two tractors are doing. It's not like you can push water anywhere. And you can't open it up for it to run anywhere. There's a lot doing U-turns, turning around and then heading back this way just yeah. to avoid it. I got my uh, daughter coming to pick me up now and I'm getting her to pick me up at McDonald's parking lot as opposed to normally getting picked up here mm -hmm. because of water. So, I mean, we've got this kind of lake right in the middle of Newfoundland Drive. Yeah. Awful. It'd be better, certainly, if the people are getting the news, uh, getting any messages on the radio, yeah, to try to avoid it if they could. Because I'm surprised that not more cars broke down out in that. Well, there's a few broke down, including our CBC van. Mm -hmm. And have you been watching some people stall, some people make it through? Yeah, it's yeah. absolutely awful. Like, this car has been here over an hour now. No one's coming, so they're blocking traffic. Yeah, I guess the tow trucks are pretty busy today. They got oh, to be, be now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> So I have to say a heartfelt thanks to the owner of Volcano Bakery and to some other pedestrians who helped us push our news van out of the road and to Avalon Towing who just came and rescued us. Thanks again to everybody who pitched in to help people today. And I'm joined by my colleague Ashley Brawweiler who's experiencing her first Newfoundland and Labrador winter. So Ashley, how did things change from a snowstorm to a rainstorm so quickly? Yeah, it was the volume of precipitation that we got today that are, uh, is leading to what's happening right now. So we take a look at some of the numbers that were reported at the airport. 10 centimeters of snow fell this morning between 930 and 1130 AM. That quickly changed through ice pellets to freezing rain to rain. 18 millimeters of rain so far has been recorded. 15 of that fell between 2 PM and 5 PM. So as you mentioned, uh, Zach mentioned those storm drains were still covered in snow when all of that rain came through. So that's what led to that flash flooding in total, though, with uh, the amount of precipitation and the melting that's happened. We're showing about 41 millimeters of rain as of four, or 43 millimeters of precipitation rather as of 430 PM. Now the bad news, if that isn't bad news already, is things are going to get cold as we head through the night tonight. So everything, all that standing water that's left will likely freeze. So definitely try and get rid of that if you can and get some salt as well before that freezes over. So I'll have the details on your full forecast when I come back in a little bit. Anthony. Well, away from Noah's Ark conditions on the Avalon in Gander, there are slippery conditions. These people got a push after getting stuck on a town road. High winds and snow hammered central Newfoundland as well. The storm closed schools throughout the region and police urged drivers to stay off the roads. And in Cape Bonavista, the winds were gusting. Mark Gray posted this video of the lighthouse on Twitter. And besides the howling wind, you can also hear the foghorn blaring in between that. Uh, the winds there have been gusting up to 70 kilometers an hour. 
And the storm hit hard in Clarenville. High winds and blowing snow made it very difficult to see. And by lunchtime, the government offices there had shut down, sending employees home. To other news now, the driver of the car Alyssa Power died in last April has been sentenced to 18 months. The driver can't be identified because she was just 17 when the fatal collision happened. Here now is Mark Quinn, who was at the courthouse this morning, and he has this story. For Alyssa Power's family and friends, it was unbearable. They sobbed and rushed out of court as Judge James Walsh detailed what happened last spring. Power's friends and family could still be heard sobbing outside as Walsh talked about the death and injuries the driver caused. But they did return to hear the judge's decision. The driver pleaded guilty last year to charges of dangerous driving causing death, dangerous driving causing bodily harm and breach of court orders. Walsh said if the driver had been an adult at the time of the crash, he would have given her a longer sentence. The driver's lawyer said the young woman wishes she had died instead of power, but Judge Walsh said he was perplexed by the mixed messages the driver's been giving since Power's death. Remorse for killing her best friend, but also what Walsh called victim blaming for what the driver said in court. At an earlier hearing, the young woman said she fled from police because people in the car urged her to keep driving. At the time of the crash, the teen was under court orders not to drive a car or have contact with Alyssa Power. Power was 19 when she died in the crash. She had given birth just a month earlier. Judge Walsh described last April's accident as a tragic and horrific event. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. And a crash that claimed the life of a man originally from this province is now under review in British Columbia. An independent investigation is underway to determine if police played a role in a fatal head-on collision. It happened early yesterday morning on the Trans-Canada Highway south of Nanaimo. According to Czech News, an RCMP officer attempted to stop a white pickup, but the driver wouldn't pull over. He continued on in the wrong direction. The truck then slammed into an oncoming SUV being driven by 54-year-old Cliff Bishop, originally from Newfoundland. Both men were killed. Bishop worked as a long-haul trucker, often driving together with his wife. The couple tragically lost their son in an accident just last year. Bishop had recently received a certificate for being a safe and responsible truck driver. A man accused of a vicious stabbing in St. John's is heading towards a plea deal. Brandon Cody has decided to forego trial and take responsibility for what happened on February 17th in 2017. Taylor King told CBC News that he woke up at a friend's house to find Cody stabbing him. He says he was knifed 10 times in total. He says they'd never met, but Cody was on conditions to stay away from the woman who lived at that house. Today, Cody was supposed to start trial for attempted murder, aggravated assault and break and enter. But lawyers Randy Piercy and Jeff Summers say they are now working on a deal. Cody could plead down to something less than attempted murder. He'll be back in court on Friday where details of the stabbing will be read out loud. The provincial government is asking what new accessibility legislation should look like. At a news conference in St. John's today, the government announced what it calls an engagement process to gather information. Starting next week and into February, there will be consultations held in Cornerbrook, Happy Valley Goose Bay, St. John's and Gander. For people who can't make those, there will also be webinars. The aim is to learn how the government can prevent and remove obstacles faced by persons who have disabilities. Until I came to this department, I thought I had some idea of the barriers that people living with disabilities uh, deal with from day to day. I had no idea at all. This is a group of people that have had to be strong advocates for themselves. Things that you and I take for granted every day in society. And so we've worked really closely with our partners to say, if we are bringing in a new piece of accessibility legislation in this province, what should it look like? And we have a clarification on a story about a protest in Roddickton that we aired last night. Our look stays here! Our look stays here! 
These people marched in the streets yesterday in an effort to get the town's sawmill reopened so it can process logs. We initially reported that they were protesting a plan to move a timber plant to Hawks Bay. The mayor of Roddickton says the town is now okay with the plant going to Hawks Bay, but she wants Roddickton's sawmill reopened so it can process the logs for pulp at the plant, which is owned by a company from the UK. She says if the sawmill reopens, it'll guarantee the town's logs will be protest, uh, processed rather in their community and they won't stop pressuring government until that happens. All right, let's get back to some good news now. Yesterday we told you about Newfoundlander Shailen Snow and her gold medal performance at the Under-18 World Hockey Championships. Well, today she's tweeting about it and showing off Team Canada's trophy. Yes, uh, and that smile certainly says it all. Yep. Shaylin posted these photos this morning on Twitter. She says, there are no words to describe how proud I am to be Canadian. And she went on to say she is honored to bring home gold. The championship game was held on the weekend Sunday in Japan. And as we told you yesterday, it was a thriller with Canada eking out an overtime win, as you can hear the Japanese color commentary guy going on, <laughs> leaving a lot of people in this province, especially in Shailen's home region of Conception Bay North, pretty dang proud. That water is really, really cold, so you can feel the cold coming through your suit. An icy night for first responders. They fall in to get you out. See how it's done after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now. If you're watching earlier, saw Zach Gowdy stranded, which is a clear indication that uh, Bruce Fender Bender Tilly was a videographer driving tonight. Uh, temperature about two degrees, three degrees, then it's getting colder now, right? It's getting colder, yeah. Uh, and potentially more dangerous if all that freezes, all I, that water. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a matter of if it freezes. I think it's when it freezes uh -oh. at this point. Yeah, so we take a look at the temperatures across uh, most of the island and up through Labrador. We're seeing temperatures below zero up through, well below zero up through Labrador, minus 23 in Lab City. Uh, through the island, anywhere other than the Avalon, those temperatures are sitting below zero and will continue to drop as we head through the night tonight. And then same goes for uh, the Avalon. So we're looking at two degrees right now. As we head through the night, we're going to dip down into the minus single digits. So uh, here's a look at the winds right now. Not windy at all along the west coast. Most of that wind is now along the northeast coast. The low pressure system just sitting south of the Avalon right now. So we're seeing that counterclockwise rotation with that. And as that continues to track a little bit further east, we're going to see those winds pick up. But because we're seeing these stronger winds right now, those wind chills are sitting in the minus teens through parts of central uh, where we're seeing that snow. Bonavista minus 11, feeling closer to minus 4 in St. John's. And then those wind chills up through Labrador in the minus 20s. And we'll continue to dip as we head through the night tonight. So here's a look at the satellite and radar right now. If we zoom in a little bit, you can see that mess uh, and all of that change back over to rain and behind it. We're seeing a little bit of freezing rain and then snow for the rest of the island, at least through central. Expecting another potentially 10 to 20 centimeters through parts of Gander and down through the interior as well. We still have those snowfall warnings in place up through Grand, Fall, Grand, Fall Windsor, Grand Falls, Windsor, and then uh, Gander down through Marystown and uh, Buren Peninsula and then the Conagra Peninsula still under that winter storm warning with the rainfall warnings in place for the southern half of the Avalon, including St. John's. I'm anticipating that these warnings will end within the next couple of hours as that low continues to pull off. And you can see that happening as we head towards the morning hours. Otherwise, we're going to see things clear out as a ridge of high pressure moves in from Labrador. And with that, we're going to see these cooler temperatures. That's why the temperatures are going to drop through the overnight into tomorrow. We're going to start to see some snow move through Labrador first, uh, continue to track across the big land and then into the evening and overnight hours. We're going to see that low make its way towards the west coast so we'll see some snow and it does look like the southern half of the Buren Peninsula and then parts of the Avalon as well could either see a rain or snow mix. So here's a look at your forecast for tonight. Temperatures dipping into the minus double digits along the west coast into parts of central as well. Grand Falls winds are minus 12 tonight. Again, another 10 to 20 centimeters generally in this area uh, as that low continues to track out. And then those windy conditions. So the winds aren't as bad right now, but will strengthen as we head towards the morning hours. Northwest winds gusting near 80 kilometers per hour. And then St. John's sitting around minus four. Everything now rain will change over to flurries or light snow uh, through the night tonight. Up through Labrador, beautiful under a ridge of high pressure, but cold. Minus 30 for Lab City with that wind chill feeling closer to minus 33. Minus 35 is your wind chill in Happy Valley Goose Bay. And then the straits looking at, at uh, chilly temperatures as well. Minus 20, minus 30 with that wind chill. So your forecast for tomorrow, we're going to see those temperatures drop. About minus 5 is the afternoon high for St. John's. Minus 9 in Gander. Still looking at that potential for some lingering flurries. Otherwise, a mix of sun and cloud is in the forecast as well. Minus 16 so quite cold up through St. Anthony tomorrow afternoon and then uh, into Labrador. Again, we're going to see all that snow somewhere between five centimeters is a good bet with this system and then those temperatures sitting in the minus teens. So let's look at your forecast. We'll look ahead a little bit, a little bit of a roller coaster as we head towards the weekend. I'll have all those details coming up. Yeah, and with that roller coaster that Ashley mentioned, the temperatures fluctuating in a whole world of slush descending on us here in the Avalon. The strength of ice on frozen ponds can actually be quite deceiving. And that's something the fire department in Portugal Cove and St. Phillips knows all about. Yes, that's why they are braving the cold winter temperatures to practice their ice water rescue training. Here now's Meg Roberts was out with the crews to see them in action. Hey, you did it. There might be a hole in this glove, I think. <laughs> Hole or no hole, with a waterproof suit, the water temperature isn't so bad. But for people who do go through the ice, that's not the case. In minus 5 degree weather in the black of night, firefighters plunge into the freezing water at Healy's Pond in St. John's. According to the deputy fire chief, this training could save lives. 
We have around 30 ponds within our town. So, you know, there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of people on the ponds, winter sports. So something that we train for on a regular basis. This time, it's my life they're pretending to save. During the practice rescue, firefighters wad through the cold water to secure a life buoy around my waist. The crew on land then reels me back in. For more complex situations, firefighters use a rescue alive board, a piece of equipment that allows rescuers to walk onto the ice and strap the victim in. The boat is then able to float across open water. The entire rescue is engineered to take as little time as possible. We have a limited amount of time from the time a call goes into 911. We get dispatch or respond to a scene. A person has been in the water for, you know, for quite a long time, could be five, ten, you know, if they're in a five to ten minutes. If they're in a pond that's not accessible by the road, it may be even longer for us to, to get there. So we need to be proficient. That's why the deputy fire chief is asking people to be cautious while exploring near bodies of water. His recommendation is to check the thickness of the ice before getting on it. Take an auger, check the holes, check in multiple places, and, and be careful around rivers and streams and places, you know, especially in ponds that you don't know. Uh, there could be underflows and things that make the ice thinner. Ice water rescuers say it's important to remember to stay calm and to breathe if you do fall into the water. Once you settle down, it's important to stay moving. Experts say you should put your arms up on the ice and kick your feet as fast as possible to slide your body up onto the ice. It's also important to turn around and get out of the water where you got in because the ice was strong enough to hold you before you fell in. According to the Canadian Red Cross, there were no water-related deaths in the winter months last year. Meg Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. So scary. Imagine oh. falling through the ice like that. No. Yeah. Cold. Uh, yeah. Terrifying. Yeah. Good for Meg for actually getting the... I was going to compliment her on her blue lipstick, but now I realize <laughs> it's actually assignment related. But uh, anyway. And some good advice in that piece, Absolutely, too, to kick yeah. your legs, get yourself up on the mm -hmm. ice. Yeah. Nice. Really emphasizing that reconciliation is something that will benefit every Canadian. Well, yesterday's shuffle saw him move from Veterans Affairs to Indigenous Services. Ahead, Anthony's interview with Seamus O'Regan.
A familiar face in a new job in federal politics, Seamus O'Regan is now Canada's Minister of Indigenous Services. Justin Trudeau shuffled him out of Veterans Affairs and we've got Seamus O'Regan in our studio in Ottawa. Congratulations and welcome to Here and Now. Thanks, Anthony. So the Prime Minister has chosen you, a white man from St. John's, to handle Indigenous services right across the country. How intimidating is this task? Well, I would just brief correction, a white man definitely from St. John's, but grew up in Labrador at a very young age. And, um, and at a, you know, when I moved there uh, with my dad and my grandmother getting off the Sir Robert Bond, uh, some of the first people I met on that first night were the Inu leadership, and I think I was 14 years old. Um, and going to Sheshashit, um, and you know, you think about it in the early 80s, it was, uh, it was just something I'd never seen before. It's something that I didn't know that people were struggling in a community. Uh, I'd never seen Indigenous people before. Uh, I'd never met Inu, and that left an indelible mark on me. So, you know, afterwards, I, my academic career, my undergraduate thesis, my master's dissertation have all been on uh, Inu political mobilization and, uh, and Inu involvement in the Lower Churchill, which of course is Muskrat Falls. Well, on that, on and, that, then, oh. and, then f and then five years at, la at the Lamb Rights table, both at the Minister of Justice and the Premier's office. Right. With all humility, that's 20 years ago. There's been mm -hmm. a lot that's gone on since. Fair enough. But this is, this is a big passion of mine and a big part of where I'm from. Okay, well, since you've made a link to the big land, maybe you can give me a sense. Are there any commitments about what you're going to try to do in this job for Indigenous people in our province? Uh, keep the momentum going, uh, the, the, the tremendous momentum that uh, Minister Jane Philpott created. Uh, my, my, you know, she's created such terrific momentum, I think, in, in making sure that we deliver better and improved services to Indigenous people in their communities that, you know, my first priority is, is reaching out to uh, leadership, First Nations, uh, Inuit, Métis leadership and saying, the, the, you know, the, the, the pedal is still to the metal. We, we are still going full 40. Um, at the same time, I also, with great humility, know that I've got a lot of listening to do, as right. I did in, in Veterans Affairs. And the trick is finding that balance, you know, listening, reaching consensus with Indigenous partners, and, uh, and, then, and then moving forward quickly uh, on, on, on actions that will benefit the lives of, of Indigenous peoples in their communities. You can sort of hear what you're saying, but, you know, from my time on the Hill, it takes a minister a good six months to be fully briefed and comfortable in the job. Looks like yeah. we're heading an election in the fall. I mean, for all we know, you might not be in the job by the end of the year. If you, if you win election, you might find yourself in another cabinet position. So realistically, is there much you can achieve between now and the fall? I think Jane Philpott has, uh, you know, created tremendous groundwork in concert with Carolyn Bennett. And I can tell you, yesterday, I mean, I would have, I would have, I would have been delighted to come on the show yesterday. But as soon as I got sworn in and was briefed by officials and my staff, my new staff, I was, I went to an Assembly of First Nations uh, summit with the Prime Minister for three hours. Um, and that was a tremendous experience because I got to hear from the AFN leadership themselves, uh, and I got to hear about their priorities. And I also, you know, clearly heard. You know, if, if you ever needed reminding of the Prime Minister's deep-seated and personal commitment to reconciliation and making it a reality for people on the ground and also really emphasizing that reconciliation is something that will benefit every Canadian, um, making sure that we all progress, making sure that right. we all have a, have, a, have a crack at it. You mentioned uh, the deep commitment and the momentum, but here we started 2019 with the arrest of 14 First Nations people in B.C. protesting a pipeline. What's your sense of the status of that relationship with First Nations people? We have to keep listening. We have to keep. We have to. We have to. You know, allow communities to deal with the issue of development on their terms, um, and then you know, once they reach that consensus, we have to be willing to to act uh, and and to work. I mean, there are. You know, one thing I learned about veterans, Anthony, and it's it's very true with Indigenous groups as well, is within these groups there are disparate opinions and dis and disparate voices. And they all need to be listened to. Um, and we don't always hear from every one of those voices. So, you know, as I did with veterans, where I did 45 town halls, I just found out last year, did 176 flight segments. Uh, you know, the same will apply here. Getting out, listening to people. But right. where we can act, acting. I and mean, Jane Philpott left tremendous momentum. And a lot of files are in play that I will see home. And uh, make sure also that I communicate those well to, to the rest of Canada to ensure that they know that we are doing good here. No doubt this is a portfolio that uh, certainly racks up the air miles. Let me end on a, on a personal question, but a personal question about something you've been public about. Uh, mm. Your battle with alcohol, which you, you've mm. spoken about in the past. How does your own fight with addictions inform you as a minister who's going to be dealing with a number of communities where addictions are a major problem? It gives you a great deal of empathy. Um, I got into trouble for saying this when it came to veterans. Um, you know, uh, where, you know, I clearly said I would never compare what I've gone through to what a veteran goes through. But 
I think, you know, I'll be perfectly blunt. I mean, when you, when you, nobody should have to compare themselves to anybody else. I mean, we have veterans in, in all different ranks and all different positions. Some have never gone beyond the wire, but just have a difficult time with, you know, the experience of, of living a certain way, a very, very, you know, an existence within the military for 25 years and then kind of left to their own devices. People, a lot of people don't handle transition well. Um, you, what, what, you, what my own personal struggles gave me is a great deal of empathy and, a, and an open heart and an open mind. And, uh, and I will continue that on. All right, uh, Seamus O'Regan, congratulations and uh, thanks for your time. Thanks, Anthony. Seamus O'Regan is Canada's new Minister of Indigenous Services. Remembering Chantel John in Con River. Just ahead, we'll take you to last night's vigil in honor of the woman tragically killed last week. Welcome back to Hearing Now. A little boy from CBS who touched hearts all over the province has passed away. Six-year-old Caden Little had a form of cancer called neuroblastoma. He died yesterday afternoon. His family set up a Facebook page to trace his journey and welcome well wishes. Now condolences are rolling in. People are sharing photos of themselves wearing green, which was Caden's favorite color. Caden loved the police and Star Wars. A few months ago, the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary held a fundraiser to help pay for specialized treatment in Toronto. And last night, the actor who played Luke Skywalker tweeted a message in his honor. RNC Police Chief Joe Boland shared a special connection with Caden. We spoke with him about the loss this afternoon. It was heartbreaking. I had been just over to see him actually and his parents. So uh, it didn't come as a shock to me, but still it's just terrible to think a little boy that age, you know, that passed away. It's, yeah, it's heartbreaking. How did you come to know him? His little boy wanted to be a police officer when he got older. And so they came over, his parents and his uh, older brother, Alexander, came over and visited me at the chief's office. and. It's just one of them things, you know, you're, you're sitting there and you, you, you worry about certain things in your life and the little boy comes in and you think about how sick he was and how strong he is. And uh, so it was, yeah, it was, uh, it was kind of a connection 
And uh, when, he, when he told me that day about wanting to be a police officer, you just saw in him he had all of the qualities that you would like to see in all our officers here. You know, he, he had his sense of humor, you know, he was very kind, he was a very bright little boy, and you know, he sat behind my desk, he put on my hat. And the RNC tried to help uh, by doing some fundraising. Yeah, so, uh, so we, we got involved, and in my experience with, with our officers here and with this community is that kindness that I don't think you see, I, I'll brag about it, you know, I think in Newfoundland that we see it. And it's helpful for everybody, you know, when I think about the nurses and the doctors and the staff at the Janeway that deal with this all the time and had to deal with, with Caden's situation and his family and how they came out to help. And, and then when I think about the members here who, who got to know Caden and who got involved, and I think about the community at Conception Bay South and the bigger community here, and uh, so it was a thing that, you know, we felt that, you know, we had the means to be able to help this family and, and we did and like I said, it was good for everybody and really, really good for that family as well to know that they had that kind of support in this community. How do you think his family is doing now? Oh, I'm sure they're, they're struggling, uh, you know, uh, and I think that was why it was important for a community to come together to let them know there's no words, look, that you can, you can give, there's no, you know, there's no mother or father or grandparent should have the to bury a child that young. But I think it's important that they see the kindness in people in this community and, and so that they can support, like the support will be there before, it'll be there during, and it'll be there afterwards. He was also a Star Wars fan. Yeah, yeah. So he's very much, you know, he was very much a, a little kid and I gotta tell you, mature way beyond his years because he had to be. And that was kind of, it was kind of interesting, but a little bit sad as well, you know, that, uh, that you know, I, I remember being over one day at the hospital and the conversations that were being had overwrite him and thinking that no little boy should have to, you know, not only to hear this but to understand it, which he did. But he never complained. He always had a smile on his face, you know. Like I said, he was very kind, you know. You could tell, you know, the kind of support that he had, the kind of family that he grew up in, that, uh, you know, this was a good family with a good little boy. And the actor who plays Luke Skywalker sent out his condolences over social media today. What do you think Caden uh, would think about that? Oh, I'm sure he's smiling brightly. He's summer, you know, I have good faith in this stuff. And, uh, you know, this is a boy that, you know, he wanted to be a police officer. I'm sure he's probably holding court somewhere. You know, a very, very bright, you know, good little boy. So. Chantel John is being remembered as a dependable friend who could light up the sky. Lanterns were released in Con River last night at a vigil held in the woman's honor. The 28-year-old was killed last week in that community. Police have laid first-degree murder charges against her ex-partner. Something life-transforming has happened to us. Ordinary words fail us, yet it is, it is impossible to say nothing. There is a sadness and grief at the loss we feel, so shocking in its horror and so gripping in its connection to each of us as a community. We started today uh, putting out uh, red dresses starting from the Harbour Britain Highway. The first one is on the yield sign that's got Chantel's name on it, then the eagle feather. When Chantel uh, comes home, we want her to pass through that corridor of, of red dresses and to always remind us of what we've lost and what we gain. We gain the family coming together to look after each other and love each other and uh, let uh, her passing be that legacy of bringing us all together. We always used to show each other new songs and one song is uh, she sent to me the day before Everything happened, and I'll never forget it. It was a song called Be Good to Her. <laughs> she helped me through my, my, uh, my difficult times. And she told me that song was made for us, and that one day we will find happiness. As we release our lanterns, may they soar high to where she rest and burn ever so brightly as she did. Let tonight remain a memory for all of us, but also be a reminder of how precious life is.
Almost four years ago, I became a quadruple amputee. Overcoming life's challenges. We're checking back in with Elaine. It's like you get a natural high when you can do things that you didn't think you could. My name's Elaine, and this is my story. This weather update is brought to you by Beltone, helping the world hear better. Welcome back, everyone. And uh, Ashley, we're already hearing from people out there that all of that water is starting to turn to ice and that it's uh -oh. getting really slippery out there. So I guess words of caution for anyone heading out this evening. But once we get past this, how are things looking? Well, it's a little bit of a roller coaster ride as we head through the week. We're going to see temperatures up and down, so freeze, thaw, freeze, thaw is uh, basically the message. <laughs> if we take a look at the future tracker into Thursday, we'll see that snow move through uh, Lab. Rador and then as well as the island and then down through the Buren Peninsula and the Avalon is where the best chance of seeing some sort of mixing in the early morning hours is possibly the rain or snow. And then in behind that we're going to see more snow possibly along the west coast and that should continue in that onshore flow right through the day on Thursday. So we could pick up some uh, pretty well, not significant accumulations, but somewhere between maybe five to 10 centimeters. It looks like so here's a look at the forecast. So temperature sitting in the minus single digits along the west coast as we head towards the Avalon. That temperature creeps up above zero as your daytime high. So that's why everything should change over to rain and then up through Labrador looking at that potential for flurries. Lab City though looks nice temperature near minus 23. So cold, but plenty of sunshine through the afternoon. Afternoon. And again, either rain or snow possible for the Buren Peninsula as well. Otherwise, it should be flurries in that onshore flow for the West Coast. Now, looking ahead uh, Thursday night, we'll see that snow continue and then things clear out up through Labrador. So a nice day on Friday, but going to stay quite cold. And then we see another system move in Friday afternoon. So that's where we're going to see that potential for snow. It's actually going to spread through Labrador as well. And then down through the Avalon one more time, we're going to see that potential to change over from rain or from snow to rain through uh, some freezing rain potentially as well. And then up through Labrador along the coast as that low pulls away, those winds are really going to pick up. So we're going to see some significant snowfall and then those strong winds. So blowing snow, maybe even uh, some blizzard conditions is possible at times, uh, not long standing, but at times we could see that. And then in the afternoon or overnight on Saturday, we're going to continue to see that snow in that onshore flow. That low pulls away in behind it. We see a little bit of clearing. Then the next one rolls in on Sunday evening uh, or rather towards Monday. This one could bring some uh, pretty significant rainfall as well. We'll definitely have to keep our eye on that one as we head through the next couple of days. So here's a look at your five day forecast. Uh, snow possible as we head towards the evening hours tomorrow. I say snow, but it'll likely just be flurries at temperature sitting well below zero tomorrow afternoon. And then on Thursday, there's that roller coaster of temperatures I was talking about. So two degrees Thursday, Friday dips back down to the minus single digits. Then Saturday, we're going to see that temperature climb right back up again. And then that snow moves in on Sunday and a temperature near minus four for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland. Now for Central, it looks like uh, the winds will stay quite strong through the morning tomorrow. So look for some blowing snow. They'll ease, but only reaching a high near minus nine tomorrow. And then Thursday, temperature a little bit warmer at minus one. Friday, dipping back down again. And then Saturday. Saturday, we're seeing to see that chance of flurries returning in minus two, minus nine on Sunday with that snow moving in. The West Coast looks generally cloudy right through Sunday with that potential for flurries or light snow in that onshore flow, generally sitting below zero between minus three and minus eight, dipping down into the minus double digits as we head through the overnight periods. And then Eastern Labrador still looking at that potential for about five centimeters tomorrow. Flurries through Thursday, Friday. Cold is when we'll start to see those cold temperatures move in and continue through the rest of the week. And that's the story for Western Labrador as well as high pressure moves in. Things clear out so we're going to see plenty of sunshine but temperatures in the minus 30s let's look at your forecast we'll look ahead at your weather photo when i come back anthony thanks ashley nunavut's first wet shelter opened this week in ikaluit it's a place where people who are intoxicated can safely spend the night and this is a response to the local hospital telling those people that they can no longer stay overnight in the waiting rooms alex brockman reports Homeless people in Iqaluit know they can come here to the food centre for a hot bowl of soup and sandwich at lunch. But later tonight, they'll be able to come here to sleep if the other two shelters in town turn them away. Both of those shelters are dry. You can't stay there if you've been drinking or using drugs. 
but at the wet shelter, things will be different. As long as you follow the safety rules, you can stay, no matter how much you've had to drink. Getting the wet shelter up and running took on new urgency last week, when the hospital stopped letting people spend the night in the waiting room. That left about 15 people without a place to stay, in the worst time of the year to be out in the cold. It's a life and death situation when people don't have a place to go at night in this kind of ex extreme cold. They can't just be outside. Staff with the Anuksha Guardians nonprofit will be staffing the shelter at the food centre for now, while officials with the Territory's Family Services Department find a permanent solution. For now, the most important thing is to make sure Akelowitz homeless all have a place to keep warm at night. It's a wide open space, so there's going to be a room divided male, female, um, and um, you know, a cot, cot on the floor. So, um, you know, it's, uh, unfortunately, it's not, <laughs> not a luxury accommodations, but um, our goal is, is um, um, a place in from the cold. Turner stresses this is all temporary, and there may be some growing pains as things get settled in. But she says staff have received some training and know how to work with people who are intoxicated. Meanwhile, a few people at the shelter I spoke with at lunch today say they welcome having a new safe space to spend the night. No one agreed to go on camera to speak with me, but a few said they've been kicked out of one of the shelters before. And it's comforting knowing that if they've had too much to drink, there's a safe space they can spend the night. The shelter opens tonight around 8 or 9 o'clock. Alex Brockman, CBC News, Iqaluit. The Saudi teenager who fled her home and has been accepted as a refugee in Canada says she feels born again. Rahaf Mohammed hopes her story will encourage other oppressed women to be, quote, brave and free. I am so grateful for all of the offers of support, for housing and friendship. Thank you to everyone for reaching out and making me feel welcome in my new home. The 18-year-old says she's disappointed her family publicly disowned her, but she has no regrets and hopes her story prompts changes to Saudi Arabia's laws. The advocacy group working with her in Toronto has hired private security to ensure her safety. She's been receiving dozens of threats every day. She says her focus now is going to school and learning English. Well, Beijing issued a travel advisory about Canada today, this in the wake of a death sentence uh, given to a Canadian man convicted for his role in a drug smuggling scheme in China. Robert Schellenberg had been sentenced to 15 years in jail, but a retrial that happened decided, the way Chinese justice does, that the sentence should be death. Yesterday, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau called that an arbitrary move Canada then issued a travel advisory warning uh, Canadians that there are risks about how China applies its laws to people. And today, Beijing issued its own advisory about Canada along with the following statement. Quote, we urge the Canadian side to respect the rule of law, respect China's legal sovereignty, correct its mistakes and stop making irresponsible remarks. MPs in the UK have resoundingly defeated Prime Minister Theresa May's Brexit deal. It's meant to establish terms for the March 29th exit from the European Union. The vote was immediately followed by a call from opposition leader Jeremy Corbyn. The government has lost the confidence of this House and this country. I therefore, Mr Speaker, inform you I have now tabled a motion of no confidence in this government. The no-confidence vote will be debated tomorrow. 202 MPs voted for the deal, but 432 voted against it. With just 10 weeks remaining to leave the European bloc, today's rejection of May's Brexit deal plunges the process into further chaos and uncertainty. The vote was viewed as one of the most crucial by British parliamentarians since the Second World War. Surprisingly, right after the UK Parliament vote, the British pound rebound from a steady decline. And now to a uh, toiletry controversy. Yeah. A new ad for Gillette is provoking a backlash at a time when the Me Too movement is changing the conversation around just what masculinity means. The ad challenges men to change their behavior and set better examples. But as the CBC's Eli Glasner tells us, some men are so angry about it, they're boycotting the company. Is this the best a man can get? The new ad cuts to the idea of what it means to be a man, boys be boys. repositioning Gillette's tagline to take a stand against toxic masculinity. No going back. Online, the ad quickly racked up millions right of thing. views and a backlash. 
Actor James Woods tweeted about the razor company jumping on the quote, men are horrible campaign. In London, Piers Morgan added his voice. Men are fed up with this. They are fed up with being told how awful we are all day. Mm. We're fed up with it, sorry. Soon customers who don't like mixing politics with smooth chins started chucking their razors. Nowadays, being in the middle, it gets you no attention. Attention is the oxygen of marketing. You want to be out there, you have to pick a side. Former ad executive Tony Chapman says Gillette would have expected that kind of reaction. He thinks the ad is a brilliant way to confront the brand's history. You know, cleat shaven faces, your, your pathway to having sex and getting kissed by a beautiful woman. They felt they had permission to play there. And in doing so, they're taking a very hard pivot for the brand. And with that comes both risk and reward. It's pretty smartly done, eh? Like Author Rachel Giza is skeptical when companies appear to be socially conscious. But she says the fact that it makes business sense is significant. The fact that this ad exists suggests that this critique um, and rethink about masculinity um, has become so much a part of the cultural conversation that a company thinks that an ad like this will resonate with men. Gillette is just the latest in a string of brands to challenge customers. When Nike embraced NFL player Colin Kaepernick, customers set their shoes on fire, but... We followed their share price, their sales, uh, the, the affinity for the brand. All of these things have been very positive since they made that move. And while the new Just ad is rubbing thing. some men the wrong way, Chapman uh, says Gillette is actually right targeting way. women who make the majority of household some purchases. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Now here's a look at your weather photo of the day. Beautiful afternoon there. Any idea where that is? Uh, heading to Twillingate. Ooh, you're in the right area. Oh! Ish. Ish. <laughs> Twillingate-ish. <laughs> Coast Guard's out there uh, enjoying that beautiful day. I'll tell you where this photo was taken and who took it when we come back. Welcome back, everyone. Well, here on the Avalon, it was definitely a day to be inside, and same for central Newfoundland. Mm, definitely, and many parts of the country are actually the same. Strangely, though, that did not slow down a couple of Toronto surfers. So Kevin Courtney and Sean Pitcher coated with ice there, as you can see. <laughs> they tried out the waves at a Toronto beach on Sunday. The beach is the brave pair 
covered in icicles. Check that out. Oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> Talk about sea spray. It's like a helmet. <laughs> I guess his beard is keeping him a little bit warm there. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they ignored an extreme cold weather alert as the temperature fell to minus 20. Minus 20. <laughs> You must really love surfing yep. to be out in that. It's, uh, one of the best arguments for facial hair I think I've seen in a while. <laughs> Looks like he's got almost like a catcher. The other guy is like a, almost like a cage being made by Mother Nature around his face. <laughs> you need like a chisel, Ugh. a hammer and chisel to get the, the icicles <laughs> off there. So you're from the north. Would you give that a whirl? Or I'm sorry, you worked in the north? I worked in the north. Uh, Would you try that kind of surfing? Sir, I have never surfed a day in my life, okay. so I probably shouldn't try that. <laughs> More a Hawaii surf kind of? I have been to Hawaii once or twice in my life, and uh, I was too afraid because the oh. waves were too big. I need little baby waves. Yeah. Just start small. Okay. Surfing, there are lots of surfers around <laughs> There's someone the on Ken Mount Drive right now. I want to give those a whirl. <laughs> hey, maybe that's what I should go try tonight in a wetsuit. Zach, Zach's waiting for you. Go try that. That's not a bad idea. That's not a bad idea. No, not at all. Yeah. Well, should we take a look at the weather yes. photo? Yeah. Oh, okay. Here we oh, go. There we go. There's building there. Okay, so this is what it's looking out, looking like outside right now. So that's going to start to freeze, right, Ashley? Yeah, we're going to start to see those, uh, all of that standing water freeze. Yeah. I don't, I'm not looking forward to going home and seeing what's waiting for me no, in no. my driveway. Shin up, shin up. <laughs> You'll get there before it's really frozen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, clear out that driveway quickly, I would say. That's true. Okay, well, picture. Not so bad uh, in this picture. Absolutely gorgeous. We talked about uh, how it was up around Brighton, actually. Oh, oh close. Taken, yeah. oh. Close. Beautiful spot. Yeah, it is a beautiful spot. So the Coast Guard up there passing Oh, that's the vessel Brighton. out there. Yeah, it's yes. the Coast Guard. You can see it just in the distance oh, there. I yeah. see. Karen sent us that gorgeous photo. Thank you so much for sending that one in. If you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca mm. because we'd love to see beautiful. them. Beautiful. Well, some of us were wise enough to head home and uh, dig a few channels. Mm -hmm. You Smart. got some salting to do. Sure do. I gotta stop <laughs> grab some salt on my way home. Hopefully, yeah. I don't. Oh, I'm not. How many shovels do you think I'm gonna break tonight, guys? You'll, you'll be all fine. You'll be fine. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. Stay safe out there. <laughs> Good night. Don't break shovels. We need ice picks.